introduce our first speaker, who is Alison Diamond, who is from uh, well, Argyle Estates, it says on here, and um, I think Inver Inverary, Inverary Castle. Yeah. Um, so she's going to speak to us about uh, understanding uh, the archival audience. Thank you. You should really wait and see whether it's worth that. Um, okay, that's good. Um, I'm, I'm a Gala States now working in Inverary Castle, but up until uh, July this year, I was actually at National Records of Scotland. Um, and I was at National Records of Scotland when I did a short piece of research that was sponsored by Arts and Humanities Research Council and the Claw Leadership Programme. And I did that with uh, Northumbria University. So that's why their logos are on. I'm afraid that one is more for the people around the world than this one for some of the room. Okay. Does that, does that make a difference? Yeah. Perfect. Do I have to say all that again, or did you get enough of it to... Yeah, okay, that's good. That's fine. Okay. Um, traditionally, of course, archives were not created for users. They were created for people, for the people who created them. They were kept because people needed their historic record of what they'd decided, what they'd bought, their financial transactions. So they weren't really created with a view to making them available to, to Joe Bloggs or, or other people... In, in the world. It was very much a, a written record of their transactions and their decisions. Um, access was always permitted, but it wasn't necessarily encouraged. Um, and that's sort of where it came up to the 19th century. You've got academic historians who are sort of providing the access to the information, doing the research and then putting it out there for people who did want to know. Um, and you've got the rise of archivists as sort of like gatekeepers letting the historians in um, and en enabling them to work with the material. You've got a growth of antiquarian societies, but it was all very sort of minimal usage up until the end of the 20th century when we get that sort of blast of genealogy and people investigating their local history. Um, and at that point, archivists have sort of changed in their, in their outlook and their profession. Um, and instead of gatekeepers, they're now almost becoming hosts and guides. Um, because it was always never, there was never really a focus on users, archives have never really developed a, a methodology or a way of, of sort of tracking users and thinking about what they want and how successfully they access material. Our way of looking after material has been for the purposes that we had it for, which was to keep it safe, to preserve it. Um, and to enable those who had created it to access their information, um, and also, you know, for that to be for them to be held accountable. So there's always been a limited number of users, and that hasn't really changed dramatically. I think recent research, I think MLA did, and there was something like six percent of people actually engaged with an archive, and that's even with the growth of genealogy. Um, it's also very difficult to browse an archive. Um, we were talking last night a little bit about how, how easily people could go into a museum and look at things. They might, not be able to have, they might not be able to feel that they could go and ask to see the collections that are behind the scene. But you do have that facility of you can just walk through the door and you can look at the things that interest you. Um, and you might go in with a purpose of something you're particularly looking for, or you might just wander in and then find something um, it's very difficult to do that with an archive. You've got to have a reason for going in. You've got to um, almost have a research question. Um, if you don't have that, it's actually quite difficult to come across an archive accidentally. Um, the, use, the, the increased use of, for genealogy, um, and there's also been a number of high-profile investigations like Hillsborough and the historic abuse inquiries that have been going on, but it's still very much a minority interest um, I was really interested in this idea of, of what people were looking for and how we could track what they wanted, particularly people who never get in there. How can you actually expand your audience if they've got to have a reason and they don't have that reason? It's, it's, sort of, it's quite an interesting one. Um, and of course, this is more of an issue now things are digital because you've got the potential to do so much more, but you can't really exploit that unless you can actually increase your audience. And nowadays as well, there's this huge emphasis on sort of public value 
and being able to justify your existence. And that's also really difficult if you don't know who your audience are and don't know how to increase it or expand it. Um, so I started on a... Just realised I don't have to. Yep. I started on um, a short piece of research. It was only three months, so I haven't done a huge amount. I've done what I could in the three months, but it's, it's not massive. Um, starting with trying to find literature and previous research. And in archives, even finding literature about user studies is actually quite difficult. Um, in 1986, Paul Conway, who was the archivist at the Gerald Ford Library in the USA, um, came up with a model for recording users' needs that was based on talking to your user, coming into the search room, working out what they wanted, and then tracking them through the process. And then after they finished their research, actually going back to them and um, finding out how successful they had been. Um, it was quite cumbersome. It never really caught on. Um, and in effect, there's really been quite a gap and nobody's really picked it up and carried it forward um, in the sort of 15, 20 years after that. There has been more in the last 10 years, but we're almost still at the same point. We haven't actually worked out a way of doing this. We haven't worked out a way of actually finding out what our users want, whether they've managed it. Um, and so we have little um, in the way of knowledge about them, and we have very little that we can use to analyse what they're wanting and the success of our service. Um, museums and libraries have done masses in this time. So archives are really sort of getting left behind a little bit. Um, in particular in Scotland, um, I couldn't find any research into the user base. Um, there's quite a lot of quantitative data collected, the number of people who go to the search room, um, the number of documents that are produced, but there seemed to be nothing out there that actually said, what did you want? Did you find it? How did you find it? Did the system work for you? Excuse me, I'm just going to pour some more. Okay, so what, what there is at the moment is there are SIPFA, that's Chartered Institute of Public Finance and Accountancy Profiles for the Archive Services. Now these are produced um, by the Archive Services providing returns, but the whole purpose of them effectively is to allow local authorities to compare the service they're offering and the costs of that service. So it's totally quantitative. It's about what you offer um, the number of access points, the number of users, the cost of providing the service, levels of staffing and volunteers, the availability of resources, um, public attendance at learning and engagement, the extent of holding, storage capacity, levels of funding. Um, they tell you nothing about whether or not the system works for the people who actually go in to use it. Um, so the PSQC, ARA user survey, um, PSQC is Public Services Quality Commission, ARA is Archives and Records Association. Um, they also have a survey of visitors to the search room, and this generally lasts for a month and a year. Um, in 2014, 107 record officers undertook the survey. That was through the whole of the UK. There were 14 Scottish archive officers which participated. Um, nine were local authority archive services, four of which were different officers of the Highland Archive. Um, Three were universities and two were national services. Um, the survey discovered that 49% of visitors were undertaking family history, which probably won't surprise anybody in the room. 77% um, of them had gone online before their visit um, for practical information on opening times, perhaps to look at catalogues and things. And the customer satisfaction was high, with 98% of the respondents saying they'd been satisfied with the visit and what they are done. It didn't ask them whether their research has been successful. It asked them whether they're satisfied with the service they received. It's also completed by those who actually go to a search room. So by definition, you're not actually speaking to anybody who accesses you or wants to access your service online. Um, I did an immediate email survey on archives to try and pick up what information people were collecting from Web, from websites and email inquiries or whatever. 
Um, I got um, 10 responses, which is probably okay, I suppose. Um, of those responses, people were keeping um, subject inquiries. They were keeping potentially copy answers so that they could not reinvent the wheel the next time they needed to give that information out again. Um, but there was very little information on whether that had been useful or any feedback or what had happened next or any of that information. So I wanted to find out more and I picked on teachers as a way of trying to assess. Now, um, the lack of a purpose or motivation for using an archive was identified by MLA in the Taking Part survey as the main reason why people don't use archives. Um, now, teachers actually have a reason to use archives. Um, they should be motivated by curriculum for excellence and the revised national qualifications. Um, the purpose of the curriculum, according to Education Scotland's website, um, is encapsulated in four capacities um, to be successful learners, confident individuals, a responsible citizen and effective contributors. And this is, the idea is that people learn this through achieving experiences and outcomes. Okay, yes, sir. that's one experience and outcome. So these are set for the different levels of, of learning and the idea is that you, um, you progress through these levels, um, which is great. And it's, it, the idea is that you're not, you're not tied to any curriculum. So whereas in England, say, the history curriculum is fairly carefully set out, you have to cover certain periods, certain events in, um, in sort of succession, in Scotland, a teacher can choose to teach whatever they want um, between P1 and S3. Once they get into national qualifications, S4, S5, obviously there is then a requirement that they teach the syllabus that the kids are going to be examined on. Um, but those national qualifications actually require pupils to engage in active learning. And certainly for history, that includes using a primary source. Um, and for some other subjects, you also have um, added value units, which mean going away doing research and such like. So there is, there is a reason for teachers to use the service. Now, as, when I was at NRS, I was actually um, an education officer. And according to Curriculum for Excellence, we should have had teachers banging on the door, demanding our services so they could deliver um, in the classroom. Um, and we didn't have that. And I found that quite interesting, which is one of the reasons I wanted to ask them why they weren't there. So my survey um, was, it was developed on, um, I can't remember its name, that's terrible, sorry, but the standard survey thing that you get online. Really? Sorry, survey monkey. Yes, brilliant, thank you. 31 questions looking at the background of teachers, their, grammar, their demographic and the experience of teaching, what level they were at. It was not directed specifically to history teachers because I wanted to involve cross-curricular and it covered both physical and online use of archives. Um, of those, um, it was important I looked at um, primary and secondary teachers um, and it was fairly evenly um, divided, 57% primary, um, slightly fewer um, secondary teachers. Um, that's a distribution. Of those, a tiny proportion were actually history specialists. So that was actually quite interesting. Um, and there was actually quite a wide use of cultural heritage resources. 47% um, had used archives for their own personal research. Um, and and that included, you know, slightly, secondary teachers had slightly more personal experience than primary teachers, but primary teachers had used archives substantially more in their own research and planning in the classroom. They were more likely to have taken their pupils out of school and they were more likely to have attended some sort of workshop or learning event. Um, finding information online, um, primary school teachers would would ideally go back to the project box, seemed to be their ideal place. Um, but quite a lot of them were looking online. 71% um, of primary school teachers were going back to existing resources. Secondary teachers were more likely to search online. And that perhaps is tied to the changes in, natural, in the national curriculum qualifications that they're teaching to. Um, I looked at the, the age demographic 
demographic of the teachers. There wasn't any clear distinction between age. It didn't seem to make any difference whether you had grown up with a computer as to whether you looked online. Um, and the most popular websites that people were visiting were Education Scotland and Scran. Now, interestingly, the popular features of those were that they included primary sources for a number of cultural institutions. They weren't just from archives. It's a relatively simple search facility. It's arranged by topic or subject. And what you were getting was immediately downloadable images of resources. They're also free to access. And because, um, well, one obviously is Education Scotland's own site. The other, SCRAN, is um, promoted quite widely by Education Scotland, and schools often get um, free access. Um, they had um, visited other websites, um, but um, not so much. I think 29% had gone to the National Library, um, less than 20% had used Scotland's People, Scottish Archives for Schools, um, Scotland's Places, or the Royal Commission, as it then was. However, 79% had found archival sources through an internet search. Um, they had little interest in looking at opening hours, top level descriptions of cat or catalogues. They wanted ready-made resources with information that they could immediately use. They also wanted it to be easy to get to and free. They, sorry, I have zipped through that because I'm running out of time. So some of the teachers at the, um, the express their frustration at the difficulty of finding material. Um, that where there was lots of detail, that was very off-putting. The search could be too time-consuming as the internet is so big. Um, they drew attention to difficulties of firewalls in schools, which can block many websites. Difficulties of being charged, which they don't have budgets for. And when they did get stuck or they didn't know how to check out the authenticity of something, they, they found that um, they felt that a, a human person at the other end would be very useful. So I don't think there's anything in that that anybody wouldn't really sort of expect. Um, but I think it's really interesting to look at a group of people who do have a reason to use it. And in particular, the thing that really struck me was their lack of um, distinction between archives, libraries, museums. They're interested in accessing primary resources and actually they don't care where they come from. And to a certain extent, I don't think we should either because we're all telling the same story, but just from different angles. Um, I think these need to be a key market for archivists because they're a conduit to the young people that they teach. Um, every teacher works with, well, every primary teacher has a class a year throughout their career. Every high school teacher will have four or five different classes in a year who they're reaching. So this is a hugely important conduit to reach people who are growing up in a world full of information um, and they're very literate and very good at finding information online but they're not necessarily very good at understanding what they found and some of the skills they're developing like triangulation is very difficult when you're looking at an original document it also supports 21st century forms of learning because it's focusing you can use archives very much to focus on big questions so this is the idea that you, you set up an avoid of discovery to try and answer a question which somebody doesn't actually have the answer to. But the pupils and the teacher go out together to try and find this through trawling the information that is available. It's, um, I think its technical name is self-organized learning environment. And it's a sort of mutually creative process. And the positives of that is it's moving away from the uh, industrial style of education that um, that Ken Robinson, for one, continually um, derides as being unfit for the 21st century. Um, am I out of time? I'm sorry. I haven't quite finished. I do apologize. If anybody wants to read the full report, I can share it. Thank you.